president and founder of the Texas Laser Institute. I'd like to take a few moments to share with you the rules and regulations that govern our practice of laser removal here in the state of Texas with you today. I hope that you find this video to be very informative and certainly one that answer a lot of your questions. So, uh, without more to begin, rules and regulations in the state of Texas. It's first, uh, first off, it's very important to understand and to appreciate the fact that laser hair removal is regulated by the state. So that is to say, what applies here in Texas could be completely different than oftentimes it is with our surrounding neighbors. Uh, so what applies in Texas uh, would be different than perhaps New York or Oklahoma or Arkansas. So the first thing is to understand that you want to check with your local regulatory bodies to ensure that you are practicing the scope of a particular license or requirement for hair removal procedures. Texas is very, we're very fortunate here in the state of Texas. Uh, the Texas uh, legislature established that laser hair removal does not constitute the practice of medicine. With that being said, however, they were uh, very specific in the rules and requirements that an individual and a facility must adhere to in order to be able to provide laser hair removal treatments to the public. So let's go ahead and review some of these considerations today and get you started along this journey of becoming a laser hair removal technician. For your reference, the statutes in Texas can be found in the Texas Health and Safety Code, Chapter 401, Sections 501 through 522. There are also administrative rules that you're going to want to reference, 16 Texas Administrative Code, Chapter 118. And there you'll see that Texas regulates laser hair removal through an administrative agency known as the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation, or TDLR for short. TDLR is a very robust state agency that governs the licensure practices of a lot of occupations in the state of Texas, including like tow truck drivers, um, uh, podiatrists, massage therapists, and even cosmetologists. It's a robust state agency, which is very, uh, it's a wonderful blessing to us because they're usually very quickly, uh, quick to address any concerns in the industry, as well as processing licensure applications. There are a few other rules and regulations that you're gonna to wanna to become familiar with as well. Of course, there's the FDA, who regulate the manufacturing of medical devices, which of course is what we use in the practice of laser hair removal. Uh, from a facility standpoint, you want to become familiar with particularly Form 3500A. That's an incident reporting form that you want to complete upon uh, particular incidences, and we can talk a little bit about that further uh, later on in the presentation. As well as, of course, OSHA. That's workplace hazard uh, rules and regulations that you want to become familiar with in the workplace. The scope of the, of the regulation here in Texas. TDR and their regulation will apply to all facilities in the state of Texas that are practicing laser hair removal services with approved FDA medical devices. So um, if you're using an FDA approved laser system, which you certainly should be, as the uh, use of one that's not FDA approved would be unlawful, uh, you will be regulated in the state of Texas uh, and normally, uh, most likely it will be under TDLR. There is an exception for physician offices, and we'll talk about that more in a bit. The device used for LHR needs to meet the specifications as provided for in the Code of Federal Regulations, that's in Title 21, Section 1040.10 and Section 1040.11. Again, that speaks to the requirements for machines to be FDA approved. A word of caution, it's not unheard of that some individuals might want to import laser systems particularly from China or other uh, countries overseas uh, because the costs of which are so substantially lower than what might be otherwise available from an, uh, from an FDA approved laser manufacturer. Uh, the difference could be startling. It could be a $5,000 purchase cost from China for something of upwards of $120,000 here domestically. Uh, as you can see, it's certainly quite tempting, but with that being said, because you're non-FDA approved, we don't have any indication, at least here in our country, uh, as to the safety and efficacy of the systems. In the state of Texas, they would certainly be disallowed. If you are to be found using one of those devices and you are to be inspected by TDLR, or uh, rather DSHS, the Department of State Health Services, that system would likely be quarantined, you would not be able to touch it, and then you'd be able to, you'd have to then go through the a disposal process through that state agency unless you found uh, an exemption beyond it. 
uh, it's certainly not um, lawful and that for uh, and for that reason alone uh, you should certainly uh, stick with the FDA approved laser systems I mentioned before that the rules and regs that we're about ready to talk about don't apply to physician practices this can be found in the Texas Occupations Code chapter 157 uh, and moreover, under the rules and regulations as promulgated by the Texas Medical Board, that's going to be chapter, I'm sorry, uh, rule 193.17. Uh, as it pertains to the practice of medicine, if a physician is to incorporate laser hair removal into his or her medical practice, which is where uh, he or she is performing diagnosis and prescription uh, in the treatment of medical disease, uh, disease illness, or condition, uh, laser hair removal in that practice will fall outside of the rules and regulations as set forth by TDLR and, and rather fall underneath the Texas Medical Board, the TMB, and, and the physician's practice will have to resort to the TMB for uh, best standards uh, and best practices in the performance of laser removal treatments in that office. Uh, that's not going to be uh, applicable to the majority of us, as the majority of us, uh, including some practices owned by physicians, uh, but separated from their practices, will certainly fall underneath uh, the rules and regulations as promulgated by TDLR requiring uh, the licensure of both of course the individual performing the procedure and of course the facility engaged in the practice of laser hair removal. Let's go ahead and quickly cover some prohibitions though before we get begun before we uh, begin too too far along the presentation for rules and regulations. TDLR may prohibit the use of a laser hair removal device that poses a significant threat to occupational or public health. So with that being said, it's again important that the device be FDA approved, be in good working condition, service regularly, and certainly with the calibration checked, uh, both externally and internally, at least once a year. Uh, our school can certainly provide some additional instruction as to uh, what some of those terms mean. But with that being said, our graduates of our 40-hour class are very well versed in uh, terms such as calibration and uh, verifying external and internal photodiode calibration uh, to uh, make sure that they stay that the laser system itself stays within uh, the FDA required uh, specifications. Cannot operate a laser hair removal facility without proper registration. It may be operate, um, and you may uh, be able to operate an LHR device with intention to perform LHR removal without proper LHR certification from TDLR. So again, both the facility that is performing laser hair removal as well as the individual performing the treatment themselves must both be licensed. Those are two separate licensures that have to be obtained uh, in this state. Cannot use a laser hair removal device to treat a medical condition unless licensed to practice medicine or acting under a physician's order. So that's very important as well. And that is to say the scope of licensure for an individual uh, that completes our 40 hour class and becomes licensed for laser hair removal is limited to just that, laser hair removal. With that being said, the same laser systems and IPL machines can only have a wide range of application use uh, and are even FDA indicated uh, to perform a wide indication or a wide range of use. Uh, those indications might uh, also include the treatment of redness or rosacea, melanocytasia, spider veins, uh, pigmentation or lentigines, sun damage, age spots or liver spots, toenail fungus, skin tightening, skin rejuvenation, uh, treatment of various nevi, removal of certain intentionates or warts or nevi. Uh, so you can see there's a large uh, arsenal of uh, wonderful indications that that system that you be that you will be using for laser hair removal uh, can certainly be used for uh, uh, beyond just laser hair removal. But as a laser removal as a laser removal technician, you won't be able to do so unless again you have a directed order uh, from a physician or a mid-level practitioner and are otherwise in compliance with the Texas Medical Board Rule 193.17. And then finally, TDLR will prohibit the use of a facility uh, or licensure facility that's taking place inside of somebody's home. So uh, that is to say, your laser hair removal facility cannot be within your living quarters. If it were to take place inside of your house, the room that you are using to practice laser hair removal must be completely partitioned off with its uh, own and dedicated uh, separate entrance uh, so that individuals do not otherwise enter into the main living facility when going to visit your facility for their laser removal treatments. A separate LHR application and registration for each facility is required. Uh, in the slides, you'll see that excludes 289.301 facilities. 
289301 facility, this falls underneath the rules and regs from DSHS, the Department of State Health Services. A 289301 facility is a laser facility. This is essentially what a physician's practice will register their facility as or under in order to engage in laser hair removal uh, treatments, particularly if they're using an Alexandrite or an NDAG laser hair removal system. If a physician's practice is just using an IPO machine, there aren't any registration requirements that they'll have to follow. But they are using a class four laser, uh, again, an IP, uh, uh, Alexandrite, a diode, or an NDAG laser hair removal system. The facility, the physician's practice will have to be registered under 289301 with the Department of State and Health, uh, DSHS. Uh, they will not otherwise be regulated by TDLR. But again, that is just exclusive for a physician's practice. For everybody that is not incorporating laser hair removal into an existing physician's practice, there are five key requirements to register a facility in the state of Texas. Those requirements are that the facility has to have assigned to it an LSO, or laser safety officer. You must have assigned to it a registered laser hair removal professional. You also have to have a consulting physician with an acceptable contract, uh, of which TDLR gives an example of. The registration fee, of course, and also a completed registration document, including the signatures of the operator of the facility, as well as a laser safety officer. So to take a moment, graduates of our 40-hour laser hair removal program come out with certification as a laser safety officer. So that requirement is actually set once you complete our 40-hour hair removal program. Individuals certainly could become a professional laser hair removal program through the Texas Laser Institute. We're one of the few state-approved certified entities. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about individual uh, licensure requirements. A consulting physician is not technically a medical director. Those are two different uh, roles. A consulting physician is mainly a physician that is reachable in the event of an emergency, who also signs off on the original operating protocols and procedures with the facility operator, and of course is an individual that performs a quarterly audit of the facility. And that's essentially everything. So this is not an amazingly active role. Unlike a medical director, it would take a much more active role in the administration and de delegation of treatments. Uh, the consulting physician is just simply there to maintain a compliance as well as to act as a backstop or rather a um, expert to address any complications uh, should any arise in the performance of laser hair removal treatments. Again, this goes back to the notion that laser hair removal in the state of Texas is not the licensed practice, is, is not required, or I'm sorry, is not uh, thought to be the practice of medicine. The registration fee is a little bit under $1,000 currently with TDLR. Uh, and it's just simply a one-time fee, uh, but needs to be renewed every two years. And then finally, uh, the application. It's a pretty simple application that needs to be completed and mailed in to TDLR uh, for purposes of uh, registering your uh, facility or licensing your facility, and you can obtain that from their website. Uh, registration for your facility is valid for two years. You must renew with TDLR every two years and um, submit any uh, updated uh, documents uh, as required, whether it be an updated uh, consulting physician agreement, updating the number of laser systems that you have at your facility, uh, the LSO, or the named professional laser hair technician. Not hard to keep up with, but you definitely don't want that licensure to lapse. Notification requirements of facilities. So within 30 days, a registered facility must notify TDLR of, if you change your business name, if you're gonna change a physical location or street address, and of course, if you change the laser safety officer, or of course, if you lose the facility professional, uh, laser hair technician, or the consulting physician that's assigned to it. So I should probably talk about this a little bit more in depth. The uh, professional laser hair technician, if the professional laser hair technician assigned to the facility uh, resigns, the facility is able to have a senior laser hair technician fulfill that role for 44 days, after which point, a professional laser hair technician, technician must be assigned to that facility. If after 44 days, a professional laser hair technician is not assigned to that facility, the facility must stop offering laser hair treatments. As far as the consulting physician is concerned, if a facility loses its consulting physician, the facility must immediately stop any laser hair treatments until a consulting physician is entered under contract, and then of course uh, is uh, notified or rather updated with TDLR of the change uh, of which you have 30 days to do so. So 
So again, be very cognizant of those two individuals because it would be unlawful to operate your facility without them, uh, and particularly for an extended period of time. There is an adverse event reporting requirement uh, from uh, laser removal facilities to TDLR, as well as submission to the FDA and or the manufacturer of the FDA approved medical device. So what does this mean? An adverse event has to be defined as either an event that results in one's death, which obviously from laser hemorrhage procedures is incredibly unlikely to, perform, or to occur. But if death were to occur from a laser hemorrhage procedure, that would be certainly considered an adverse, adverse medical event and reportable to both uh, TDLR within 24 hours, and that also must be reported to the manufacturer as well as to the FDA. Other adverse uh, events, if not uh, exclusive of death, would essentially require a event or a complication uh, necessitating medical intervention to prevent permanent complication or, or effect to the skin. Uh, so there's certainly a little bit more room for interpretation in this requirement. I would certainly defer you to your consulting physician uh, to make the determination if a adverse event uh, occurred or exists uh, following a complication and with their expertise uh, make the um, relevant reporting requirements to both the FDA, the state of Texas, and to the manufacturer. There are going to be some operational requirements for the facility, but these are very easy to follow as well, but just because they're easy, I don't want to understate their importance. There must be a physical inventory audit conducted by um, usually the professional laser hermal technician of all the laser hermal devices on an annualized basis. That is to say, every year, you'll have a piece of paper that is typed up identifying all the FDA-approved laser hermal devices that you're using at your facility, including the manufacturer's name, model number, and serial number, uh, as well as, of course, the location in which it's located, the name, title, and signature of the person performing the audit, and, of course, the date in which the audit was conducted. And that has to be on file at the facility as a method of recording the devices that you're using in the performance of laser hormone treatments. It's also good practice too uh, for property insurance reasons. The registrant or the facility shall maintain records of receipt, transfer, and disposal of LHR devices. That is just simply to say, you have to have a record of when you take possession of that device. If you were to transfer ownership of that device, you have to have a record of when you transferred ownership and to whom you transferred it to. And of course, if you were to dispose of the device, uh, the date, date and the method by which you dispose of your laser hair machine. And you can see on our slide that the laser hair manufacturer's name, model serial number, date, the name and address of the interested parties, and the name of the person making this record have to be included on that record. The laser hair facility operator is responsible for the adherence to follow TDLR rules, uh, which we certainly make uh, available to our students through our 40 hour class and on our website. And then, of course, the laser hair removal operator cannot claim that laser hair removal is free of any risks or unknown harms. In addition to that, you cannot claim that laser hair removal has any medical benefit. Again, keep in mind, in the state of Texas, laser hair removal does not constitute the practice of medicine, so you do not want to, do not want to hold out that it does the same uh, as otherwise. You're certainly running afoul of the limitations on your scope of licensure and certainly entering into the unlicensed practice of medicine in the state of Texas, which is a very serious offense. I should also make note that Texas is very unique in that we have a very powerful consumer rights um, statute called the Texas Deceptive Trade Practices Act. It's this act that provides for um, monetary penalty if um, a consumer is uh, wrong by deceitful or misleading trade practices. Uh, the penalty, I should say, is one that stems out of a simple claim uh, it can involve up to three times their damages if done knowingly and lawfully, uh, unlawfully rather. So you want to certainly make sure that your advertising is free of anything that would be deceptive or misleading to the consumer. Uh, such examples might be uh, statements like, you will never have to shave again. Uh, it is oftentimes thought that laser hair removal is a process and that complete uh, hair removal is usually unattainable and the idea that one can certainly grow new hair uh, throughout uh, their lifetime and how um, the uh, regrowth of that hair or new follicular development and the likeliness of it occurring would uh, keep a claim uh, such as um, 
no longer having to shave at bay. And you can certainly see how that would be misleading and uh, that would be, be unlawful with a consequence uh, particularly strong on the consumers we have here in Texas. So uh, be careful with that for sure. And then finally, if you were to terminate your operations of the facility, you do need to pass a notification on and running to TDLR so that they can update their records accordingly as well. The laser safety officer, again, a required component of any laser handle facility. The laser safety officer has a variety of um, official capacity and responsibilities, but predominantly that they are there to ensure that the users of the laser handle machines are trained in the risks uh, that lasers uh, impose onto the skin, health, and well-being of individuals. Uh, the laser handle uh, laser safety officer is not necessarily there to ensure that folks know the proper settings to use, but rather the unique hazards that exist with the use of laser systems. They possess, a, by statute, a corrective action that's pretty strong, which is to say, if a laser safety officer believes that there is harm, or the laser system cannot be used safely, or the individuals present are not adequately trained in the safe use of the device, they can uh, take immediate corrective action, including shutdown of the operations if necessary. So the LSO is certainly not a position to be taken lightly. Uh, the LSO is responsible for ensuring that proper maintenance logs of the laser hair systems are being kept. That is to say, anytime a laser hair system or device is maintained, our maintenance is performed on the device, a, a proper written log is being maintained. The laser safety officer is required or is responsible for ensuring that proper eye protection and other safety measures are being followed, adhered to, and are adequate for the protection of its users. Ensuring facility compliance with TDLR rules, including audits and facility protocols, are being adhered to. So quarterly audits from your uh, consulting physician, annual audits of your inventory, and of course, facility protocols for the safe and effective use of the systems need to be updated regularly, reviewed with new staff members, and continued training and education to existing staff members are all things that the LSO should uh, be on top of and ensuring those things are taking place. So they're of course maintaining the facility records, as well as finally ensuring all uh, LHR providers are properly trained, certified, and also in compliance with the TDLR rules. So that gives you a nice overview of the facility requirements. Again, if you're not a physician incorporating laser hair practice, or the practice of laser hair into your facility, you're going to follow under the rules uh, promulgated by TDLR and as a consequence, the facility will have to be licensed. And we just require, and we just reviewed uh, those licensure requirements for the facility, uh, the five key things that you're gonna have to know or have to have in place, uh, as well as a little bit more of an in-depth conversation about what those things are, all the way down to the audits and inventory control mechanisms. So that's your facilities. After we do the facilities, now we have to talk about you as an individual because both have to have their own separate licenses. As an individual to perform laser hair removal in a licensed facility, you have to go through a couple uh, steps yourself. Uh, you have to first and foremost submit a, an application, a complete application to TDLR on their approved forms, which can be downloaded from their website. You have to submit to them any applicable fees, pass a criminal background check, and of course have the re uh, requisite uh, training and certification from a state approved uh, training program, such as the Texas Laser Institute. We do caution that the name on your application to TDLR and the name on your certificate as granted to, as granted to you by your training provider and the name on your government issued ID must all match up. If there are any discrepancies between those three, your application will most likely be returned to you and they may charge you an additional amount of money uh, for not following the instructions correctly. Uh, so certainly save yourself the headache and make sure that those three things are lining up nicely properly and you won't have any problems. Registration with your certificate is valid for two years. I should say registration or your licensure with TD TDLR is valid for two years from date of issuance. Uh, and you can certainly renew. Uh, and the renewal process is very streamlined, it's very easy. It uh, only requires eight hours of continuing education credits uh, every two years as well as, of course, uh, submission of a renewal application and its required fee. Uh, again, when you go to renew your, uh, 
your license with TDLR, they will rerun a criminal background check. If you have any questions about uh, their criminal background check procedure and what might be a disqualifier, we um, certainly encourage you to contact uh, TDLR directly and they'll be able to provide you with some additional guidance as to those factors. So uh, this training aspect, what's involved with the proper training? Well, first and foremost, you have to go to a state approved career school and college. So that's a vocational college approved by the Texas Workforce Commission. In addition to that, that school also has to have approval by TDLR to train and certify folks in the use of lasers for hair removal. So the Texas Laser Institute is certainly such a state approved career school college. We have two locations. Uh, we're certainly one of the leading providers in the state of Texas for training and certification of individuals wanting to gain licensure to practice laser hair removal treatments. Now, in the state of Texas, it's important to understand that there are four distinct levels of registration or licensure that an individual can maintain. So in the case of a facility, it's just one, right? Your facility is either licensed or it's not. Very straightforward and simple. The individual, however, has four different levels of licensure. The first is a laser hair removal apprentice in training. And so what does it take to become this first level? And of course, as you can probably guess, you can't skip steps. You have to go in order, right? So the first level is out of an apprentice in training. You have to complete, it's not difficult to do, a 40-hour state-approved laser removal training program, again, such as through the Texas Laser Institute. Our program is 40 hours over four days. It's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. In four days, you become licensed, or certified rather, as a laser removal technician. You take our certificate, you submit it to the state of Texas, TDLR, with their application and the fee, as well as a copy of your driver's license, and then they will license you, license you as a certified laser hair removal technician, uh, albeit an apprentice in training. That's your first level of licensure. Now, there are some limitations when you're licensed as an LHR provider uh, holding the apprentice in training uh, designation. And that is predominantly that you will not be able to perform treatments uh, by yourself. You must have either a senior or a professional laser removal technician in the room with you. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, that's a little bit inconvenient and perhaps um, a little bit uncomfortable, uh, particularly for the patient at times. And as a consequence, uh, a lot of our students wish to upgrade or elevate their level of licensure to that of a laser hair removal uh, technician, dropping the apprentice in training designation from our license. So to do that, all you need to do is complete 100 treatments following your certification uh, through our school. So you first become certified by taking the 40-hour class. At that point, you have to decide to either just to submit your registration documents to the state of Texas to become licensed as an apprentice in training, or you wait, you complete your first 100 treatments, and then you submit this to applications and together at the same time, both the apprentice in training application and then the technician level application. That's the one time you can accelerate your registration process with TDLR, which essentially allows you to uh, become, become licensed for the uh, higher level of licensure without having to follow the steps uh, sequentially. You, you can do this two simultaneously. So how do you do it? You simply perform 100 treatments um, uh, underneath the direct uh, supervision of either senior or professional laser hair technician. So not too terribly difficult. Now I should say it's 100 treatments, not 100 hours. So typically speaking, the typical full body treatment can produce up to 25 to 30 treatment areas. So with four patients or four clients, you'd be able to complete 100 treatments and you can do that within a single day. Uh, the Texas Laser Institute offers that as a practicum and we certainly could tell you more about that course uh, should you be interested in it. But it is a wonderful way for you to accelerate your licensure to become a technician at which point you no longer need to be directly supervised by either a senior or professional laser hair technician. You can actually be in the room by yourself, although there has to be a professional on site at all times. After that, we're gonna move to the senior laser hair technician, right? So you have first the technician, the apprentice of training, then you have your technician level, now you have your senior level. To become a senior, you have to uh, essentially supervise 100 treatments. So before you had to perform 100 treatments, now you're supervising 100 treatments. Might seem a little bit counterintuitive or backwards, but TDLR essentially wants you to have experience supervising other individuals 
in order to become a senior technician, as essentially you will be supervising apprentices in training. So with that being said, you can supervise anybody. You can supervise an apprentice in training, albeit you'd have to have another senior or professional in the room with you at that time, because you're not a senior yet. But you can supervise a technician, you can supervise a senior, or you can even supervise a professional. And the idea there is that as you're supervising or watching a professional or senior, um, you can certainly pick up on some additional information and experience and knowledge that perhaps you didn't have before. And of course, if you're supervising another technician or maybe a technician for such a training, uh, you perhaps have some additional insight or guidance from a, either a senior or a professional that has to sign off on your logs. The um, treatment sheets themselves, as I may have alluded to, have to be signed off by the professional technician. Uh, you cannot supervise treatments until the receipt of the issued uh, certificate and license as a technician. Uh, so let me clarify that. In order to begin your 100 treatment supervision, you have to first be licensed as a laser animal technician. I mentioned earlier you can't skip steps. So uh, the way this typically works is a student will complete the 40-hour class, then they will perform 100 treatments, submit that, uh, uh, that documentation off to the state of Texas, they will receive back within about three weeks a license as a technician, and then and only then can that individual start to supervise 100 treatments. You can't date the supervision of your 100 treatments prior to the date that your license was issued to you by TDLR. If they are licensed, or if your treatments are actually dated ahead of the time that you are licensed, they will be rejected and sent back to you to do all over again. And then finally, the individual can become a professional laser hearing technician. The benefits of a professional are really twofold. One, you can uh, license, you can uh, register your own facility underneath your licensure. And then two, as a professional, you can be there by yourself. You don't have to have anybody else present in order to perform treatment. And then uh, finally, the third uh, benefit is uh, simply that you can sign off on the treatment logs of an individual wanting to become a senior technician. So that technician upgrading to a senior their treatment logs must be signed off by a professional. So those are the three things that a professional is able to do. As you can plainly tell, if you're looking at wanting to start up your own facility or hair removal practice, becoming a professional laser removal technician is most likely in your best interests because you're going to want to be named that facility's LSO as well as professional laser removal technician um, just for congruity and um, peace of mind's sake. Uh, that way you need not worry about uh, having to always hire or replace somebody should they um, want to resign or can no longer work for you. And that's it. So those are the facility license requirements as well as the individual licensure requirements. Uh, I hope that's really quite informative. And then we'll touch now on uh, some of the more um, nuanced areas of um, regulation of laser animal technicians in practice. A continued education, I alluded to this before, every two years you're required to have eight hours of continued education to maintain your licensure. Uh, the Texas Laser Institute makes that made uh, available to our students that complete the 40-hour class at no charge. So that's actually on our website. You just simply log into your student dashboard. You can watch the videos and in real time, you'll be able to answer the questions that correspond to those videos. And then once you complete the uh, examination with a passing score of 80% or above, your certificate will be issued to you and it's available for you immediately for download uh, in your student portal uh, where you can then print it off and submit it to TDLR to renew your license. So very convenient there for individuals that have not taken a 40-hour class but perhaps took it elsewhere or were grandfathered through years ago. Uh, you certainly can perform or take advantage of our continuing education, uh, the cost of which is just simply $200. Uh, you can contact our school for more information. Consulting physician. So the consulting physician, again, is not the same thing as a medical director, and that's an important distinction. as a consulting physician is typically not as actively involved. Uh, I may have already mentioned that their roles are pretty streamlined and straightforward. Uh, their, their most important role is to be reachable in the event of an emergency, shall one uh, occur, and then of course one, uh, two, to be able to provide continuing uh, care uh, in the event of consultation, I'm sorry, in the event of a complication um, following a laser animal procedure. Um, again, those are the two most important roles a consulting physician probably plays uh, once a facility is licensed. The consulting physician is not the same thing as a delegated physician. The state of Texas actually requires technically two physicians. One again is your consulting physician, and the other is a, a delegated physician 
A delegated physician is nothing more than a colleague of your consulting physician who can be reached in the event that your consulting physician is not available. Uh, most consulting physicians will have a professional colleague who fill, uh, fulfills or fills in for them when they're on vacation. Uh, it's that individual that the state of Texas wants to make sure that you have uh, at your disposal. Uh, so again, in the event that the consulting physician were on vacation, out of town traveling, or otherwise not reachable, you do have a backup physician uh, ready to contact. The uh, consulting physician may not provide auditing or supervision of a senior or professional laser normal technician unless they too are also registered with TDLR uh, and of the appropriate level as provided for uh, depending upon um, the logs that they're trying to sign off from. But because they are a licensed physician, they are able to accelerate their licensure with TDLR. Uh, they, upon showing uh, 100 treatments and having supervised 100 treatments, they can actually uh, become uh, licensed as a senior technician without technically taking the 40-hour class. And then upon completion of the professional certification examination, they too can become a licensed uh, professional laser dermal technician. So they can actually skip the 40-hour class or bypass the 40-hour class, but they still must show TDLR, uh, both their license as a physician and the completion of their 100 treatment pathophilms uh, to become licensed as either a, a technician or a senior technician. They do have some additional responsibilities uh, that go far beyond, of course, the um, uh, addressing of complications. The uh, first requirement is that their primary practice be within 75 miles of your facility. So that is to say your consulting physician cannot be in a different state. They have to be within 75 miles, licensed here in Texas. So if you're um, in Amaretto or on the northern side of uh, the Texas border, you want your physician to uh, come from uh, across the state line and they're not licensed in Texas, they're not going to be able to fulfill that role. The, the facility medical or uh, consulting physician must be licensed in Texas. And again, their practice must be within 75 miles of your location. The other um, very important uh, role of your consulting physician is to agree with the facility operator slash owner uh, the protocols and procedures that will be adhered to. Uh, this really goes to what are the pre-treatment, post-treatment uh, uh, care uh, considerations that the facility will uh, abide by. What uh, does that medical intake sheet look like? Uh, what um, limitations might there be uh, as to the areas that you'll be able to treat? What contraindications will preclude treatment from taking place? Uh, what contraindications or medications might require person consultation with the consulting physician prior to the treatment being performed? Uh, which medications will eliminate it completely? How long a patient must be off of medication in order to uh, gain a treatment uh, from the facility? Those types of protocols must be first established, agreed to, and practiced and integrated into the facility. And then of course the physician is responsible for at least four times a year or on a quarterly basis ensuring that those protocols and procedures are being adhered to by the facility and uh, they can perform that audit uh, in the furtherance of that responsibility. Uh, I should mention the Texas Laser Institute as part of the 40 hour class uh, provides all that information to our students. So while it might sound a little, uh, uh, a little bit uh, uh, difficult to obtain or ascertain that knowledge, uh, that's what our 40 hour class is really achieving uh, for our students. Uh, in a way that we hope is a turnkey solution for our students uh, that want to start their own medical spas or laser removal practices. Uh, and finally, uh, I mentioned this already, consulting physicians audits. Uh, they can delegate this, so a physician can delegate their quarterly audit to a mid-level practitioner, which would be a PA or nurse practitioner, uh, but the physician must still sign it. Uh, the audit is to include certain uh, requirements such as the date, the facility's name, uh, the assessment of the overall compliance to the protocols and procedures, of course, the signature of the physician, the operator, and of course, uh, any uh, PA or nurse practitioner that may have been performing the physical audit as well. So that's your consulting physician. Now we get into our devices. As I mentioned earlier, uh, they must be an FDA approved device. Use of a device that's not otherwise FDA approved is unlawful in the state of Texas uh, and would certainly result in its um, porn. Uh, and it being quarantined uh, from DSHS if uh, they were to come and inspect your facility upon a report 
from either the general public or your competition. The uh, purchase of the laser hair machine must take place on the written order of a physician. So this is unique, simple to do, but certainly something that's very important. In order for a facility to purchase a laser thermal device, the consulting physician must write out a prescription, including the name, the date, the quality of the devices, name, address, number of the registered facility authorized to purchase the device, any uh, limitation as to its use, the uh, name of the physician's actual physical practice, their address, uh, and of course, a statement that the prescription is valid up to 12 months, which is a limitation imposed by the Board of Pharmacy uh, here in Texas. And finally, of course, the physician's signature. So you do certainly most want to, most definitely want to have on file at all times and uh, certainly readily able to be inspected by the TDLR that uh, up-to-date uh, prescription for that medical device uh, and for the use of that medical device for laser hormone procedures uh, by the facility. If DSHS were to come out and do an inspection uh, and not be able to ascertain who your consulting physician is, uh, and of course those contracts, I'm sorry, as, uh, and of course the uh, uh, prescription for that device, the device would be quarantined. Uh, if TDLR were to come out and do an uh, inspection of your facility, uh, you would certainly be cited for a violation. Uh, whether or not the device would be quarantined might be left to their discretion, but uh, certainly DSHS could certainly quarantine that, uh, that device and prevent you from touching it until um, you were to show that you're otherwise in compliance with the law. General requirements. So facilities, of course, have uh, general operating requirements by law that you must follow. We talked about the professional laser hair uh, technician and how you must have one present at all times. If uh, he or she were to leave your clinic, you have up to 44 days to replace him or her. Uh, but a senior technician must either be uh, directly involved at that point in supervising all treatments or either doing them themselves, uh, as well as either the uh, presence of the physician. So that is to say, if your professional laser hormone technician leaves, the senior technician can then take over and perform all the treatments for up to 45 days without any, any additional supervision. Or of course, the physician can actually come in and do the treatments uh, him or herself or provide the necessary supervision. So uh, it's very important to have that professional hair removal technician. Uh, required on site is your laser manual. So every laser manufacturer that's FDA approved will certainly provide you with an operator's manual that must be on site at all times. And then of course you want to have documentation that each of the uh, providers, each of the laser hair technicians has actually read that manual and understands its contents. Uh, and you'll want to make sure that that's documented in a compliance partner uh, and ready for inspection. There is what's called a controlled area. This is the area, or what's called a nominal hazard zone. It's the controlled area in which the laser system and its use might impose danger on an individual. It's a restricted area, uh, and that area must be demarcated as such. So that is to say your treatment room is most likely gonna be your controlled area. The treatment room is your nominal hazard zone. It has to be demarcated with proper signage, which we'll show you in a moment. Uh, and of course, uh, the proper, uh, proper safety precautions must be integrated and of course, uh, uh, reviewed uh, regularly by the laser safety officer. And uh, finally, uh, of some basic operating requirements, the key. So each laser system that's FDA approved has some type of interlock on it, whether it be a password or a key or even both. The idea here is that when the nominal hazard zone is not being used or it's not supervised, so that is to say your laser treatment room, is going unused, that you will take measure to prevent its unauthorized use by just simply either removing the key from the room or ensuring that nobody that uh, ought not have it, uh, it does not have access to the password to otherwise make this system operational. Uh, there are some interesting cases that stem from that. Uh, again, uh, learn from those mistakes of others. Uh, even at nighttime, make sure that that key is removed from the facility so that an individual such as janitorial staff would not have access to your laser system as if they did, and were to actually turn it on and fire it, causing a complication to him or herself, uh, you certainly would have some potential liability there, or could have some potential liability there. Uh, protective eyewear must be worn by all individuals using LHR devices uh, and that are present during this operation. Uh, protective eyewear must be the correct eyewear. We teach that in our class as to how to determine what eyewear is correct. 
the amount of safety that the armor provides to the practitioner, clinician, and to the patient, and the importance of not uh, mixing up eyewear uh, or otherwise just settling for use of sunglasses uh, or tanning shields, uh, both of which would be amazingly inappropriate. Goggles must be examined, examined for defect at least once every 12 months. Uh, the documentation of examinement must take place, uh, and this is something that the laser safety officer will ultimately oversee and control. Um, the consent sheets. Uh, by law, the laser hair removal facility must give to its clients a consent sheet. A consent sheet has to outline the relative benefits, risks, and alternatives to the treatment. In Texas, particularly, the one thing that the state requires to be in that consent sheet is some type of notification that says that failure to use the proper eye protection may result in damage to the eye. That must be in your consent sheet. After that, there are no other requirements by state law per se, but rather would rather would, but rather would be dictated and governed by best practices. Uh, individuals that go through our 40-hour laser hair removal treatment program are given model uh, intake sheets and consent sheets, uh, both in electronic uh, format and as part of our class. Uh, because we give them to our students electronically, they can further edit, revise them, uh, they put their own name and branding uh, onto those forms and start to integrate them into their facility with very little uh, uh, work uh, and with some fantastic ease. So I hope that folks uh, take advantage of those forms uh, as they've been carefully developed over the years. Uh, additional requirements, the laser facility registration and individual registration certificates must be displayed in a conspicuous place uh, that is to say, in an open public area that a client would be able to see and appreciate. Again, each of these must be posted publicly um, and uh, done in a way where your patients will be able to see that in fact you are registered. Uh, and then finally, a warning sign. The state of Texas requires that you post a warning sign uh, that is at least on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, font size of at least 26, if not larger, and it must contain the following wording. I've provided that for you here in this slide. Uh, you can literally copy that verbatim and uh, make sure to place that on your wall in a conspicuous place to keep you in compliance with that requirement. I mentioned earlier the nominal hazard zones where the treatment room itself must be demarcated as having a unique danger. Uh, we do that here in um, laser hair removal by providing a particular type of sign. The state of Texas requires a sign, as I've shown you in this chart, it must have the word danger in white, encapsulated in a red oval, encased in black. Uh, that has to appear just like I've shown you in this diagram. It has to have certain language on it, and it has to identify the laser system and its pulse characteristics, uh, which could be added to this sign as well, as well as the classification of laser. If it's an IP, IPL machine, it's a class 3B. If it's a YAG, Diode, or Alex, or a Ruby laser for that matter, it's a class four laser uh, for purposes of the sign. Uh, we give you the information as to where you can purchase the sign from, and um, I certainly recommend that you uh, pick those up. It's a very easy way to uh, protect uh, the unaware uh, client of the dangers in that room and to uh, come in compliance with that state requirement. Uh, additional requirements, for you particularly pertaining to records. Uh, record keeping must be retained for a period of three years. And as you can see here, requires uh, certain aspects to be uh, written down. Uh, you need to have some type of client identification, whether it be their name or some type of code, where you can identify who that record belongs to or pertains to, the date of the procedures that you performed on that patient or client, I should say, uh, that there was actually some type of, uh, on your, on your uh, uh, medical record, if you will, you have to have some type of indication that you have a consent sheet on file from that client, the name of the technician performing the treatments, as well as the level of the registration of that technician. If the technician was supervised, you have to have uh, the name and the level of the supervised technician. Of course, you want to record the settings that you use throughout the treatment. And then finally, you need to identify the laser system that was used and the performance of that treatment, uh, most likely by just its serial number uh, would be more than adequate. Uh, interestingly enough, if you were to uh, somehow lose or misplace your laser system, or more likely if it were to be stolen, you do have to report that to uh, TDLR 
I'm sorry, not TDLR and uh, DSHS uh, within uh, 72 hours. Uh, the idea here is that if you do report to the DSHS, the Department of State Health Services, who regulates uh, radiation emitting devices, uh, if it were to be found by the police, they would, could contact DSHS, find out who it belongs to, and presumably return it to you. So it's certainly something that you'd want to do. It also um, helps to ensure a lack of some, some type of liability. If your system were to be stolen and you reported it as being stolen and somebody actually goes off and uses it, causing injury or harm to another individual, at least you've taken some type of remedial step to show that it was no longer in your possession, um, which is a, a good step to take. Uh, I give you a list here of the fees for registering in your facility as well as the different individual registrations uh, for your convenience. As you can see, it's not the most costly uh, registration process in the world. Uh, and I believe uh, TDLR has done a nice job at keeping those uh, fees as low as reasonably possible. Uh, record retention, I believe I mentioned this previously, you're required to keep your records for three years. That both is for the, electro, uh, the medical records or the uh, charting records, I should say. Again, we don't practice medicine with laser hair and wool, uh, but I will by default refer to it as a medical record just for ease. Uh, usually these things are electronic, so an EMR, electronic medical record. Uh, type of solution that most people are going to go with um, to fulfill that requirement. Uh, we have quarterly consulting physician audits that we have to knock out, the annual inventory audit, the annual protective eyewear audit, all those things must be retained for three years and then of course like I mentioned the procedure uh, tracking, the EMR form if you will, also uh, recorded for at least three years. You must maintain files of, again of the receipt, transfer, disposal of your devices until the termination or expiration of the facility's registration. Client confidentiality. The notion here is that does laser hair removal constitute the practice of medicine? No, but are we still perhaps governed by the general notions of HIPAA? Um, yes and no. Uh, it certainly is thought that those types of best practices uh, would certainly be applicable. So maintaining client confidentiality is certainly a good practice and something that you'd want to do and take very seriously. Whether or not we would fall underneath the uh, realm of HIPAA is perhaps debatable, but I do believe the state of Texas has sided with the state uh, side of conservatism, and in the eyes of the state of Texas, uh, particularly from TDLR, uh, they are mindful in keeping uh, client confidentiality uh, and therefore integrating uh, HIPAA compliant measures. So we would certainly um, encourage you to do the same. There are cases in which um, uh, client confidentiality uh, would be shared and that's of course if uh, by a court order or subpoena the disclosure is other, otherwise allowed by law, client consents in writing to release the records, uh, a health authority such as TDLR would come in and do an inspection and want to see the records. Uh, those are certainly common, um, common uh, reasons why a chart might be uh, released but again otherwise a uh, HIPAA side, the state of Texas does require that you certainly do keep confidential any client record. Um, for that reason, we would recommend to perhaps go a little bit further and integrate HIPAA uh, considerations into your uh, practice. So we've talked about client retention, now let's talk about client confidentiality. In the state of Texas, it is certainly required that you keep confidential. The uh, client records that you're recording on behalf of your laser hair uh, um, customer. So you're not allowed to, in the state of Texas, disclose those, disclose those records unless it falls under one of the following exemptions. Obviously, if the client or authorized client representative were to authorize the disclosure, you certainly can at that time. Be very careful of minors. Uh, if the client is under the age of 18, you need to have parental consent to release that form. The client's consent at that point would not be valid. TDLR, TMB, the Texas Medical Board, a health authority or an authorized agency um, may also request those records, particularly in their investigation of any type of complications or otherwise relevant, um, relevant issues pertaining to your compliance uh, to the rules and regulations. Uh, you certainly can disclose it at that point. A uh, client consents to writing to release the records to another party, you can certainly release it at that point. Again, just being mindful of um, if an individual is under the age of 18, needing to have a parent or guardian 
if a court order or subpoena were to demand the release of the same, you can do it underneath that uh, circumstance. And then finally, if the release is otherwise uh, allowed by law. Uh, oftentimes, students will ask us, well, does HIPAA apply? Well, this is uh, more or less uh, in line with a lot of the HIPAA considerations, and that is to say, uh, client uh, release is not allowed unless uh, it falls under one of these exemptions. Um, the only other considerations would certainly be with client confidentiality, a heightened sense of staff awareness as to not speaking about client client encounters situations or scenarios when there's a, even the slightest chance that someone outside of your office or someone that does not have the need to know that's outside your office um, or even inside your office for that matter. Um, shit. Scratch all that up, Ram. I'm gonna go. One second. I'm gonna do this one go real fast. <laughs> I can cut, I'm gonna cut where that. you left off. I'm I gonna do a client confidentiality. Go I can, I can you wanna do it over? Up. I said something there that wasn't really technically correct. So <laughs> like, and then finally, we have client confidentiality considerations. So in the state of Texas, it is certainly required that you keep the treatment records of your clients confidential. And they may not be shared unless um, it falls underneath one of the following exemptions. A client or authorized client representative requests the record. You certainly can authorize your staff or yourself to provide the client uh, charting history to him or her. If the client consents in writing to release the records to another party, you can certainly release those records to another party. Just be a little bit mindful, however, that if it is a uh, minor, a person underneath the age of 18 years of age, that consent must come from the parent or guardian. Uh, if the state agency that real, uh, regulates us, such as the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation, the Texas Medical Board perhaps, a state health authority or an authorized agency uh, requests a record, they can be released under certain circumstances there. If you have any questions as to exactly what those circumstances may be, we certainly recommend the, uh, that you reach out to a knowledgeable attorney to provide some additional guidance. If, of course, by court order subpoena, uh, you certainly can release the records in that case, and then otherwise if it's allowed by law. With that being said, I certainly caution you that your staff or the individuals that have access to these records are simply based on a need to know. So individuals that do not need to have access to these records ought not have easy access to the records at all, or there should be some type of tracking system to ensure that those that do have access to it uh, that might not have a need to know are making the proper record of accessing these systems, the reason why, uh, and the justification therefore, uh, and that's you know, certainly kept uh, with the facility operator and manager. With that uh, also being said, it's important that folks that have access to these records uh, do not start to speak about clients, client encounters, or scenarios uh, in the presence of anybody that does not have access to the records. So unauthorized individuals, other clients, uh, strangers, uh, even the custodian or uh, janitor at night. If there's even the slightest chance of somebody that does not need to have access to them uh, learning of a client encounter, and anything that is confidential to that client, uh, it's important that staff not speak at that time and uh, find a secure uh, time and place to have those conversations. And that about wraps it up. So that's a very nice and I hope abbreviated, uh, but to the point uh, review and um, overview of the rules and regulations, particularly here to the state of Texas that govern the practice of laser hair removal. And again, keep in mind, this is very state specific we do have some experience in other states, so if you do um, have any questions pertaining to these rules and, res rules and regulations here in Texas or beyond, that's what they do call us again at 832-767-0977. It would be our pleasure to try to further assist you the best we can, and we look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you again.